All right, guys, if anyone has any questions, I'm about to get kick off my uh, talk. Talking about property investments. So if you have any questions on real estate investment, be sure to ask a question. If you have, I'm going to be covering news and events from the... Um... Right, guys, if anyone has any questions... Oh, better turn off the sound here. Talking about property investment. Okay. It's confusing because I'm going live stream on YouTube and I'm also going live stream uh, on a Zoom call. So there's three different uh, three different platforms in use here. So guys, if you missed last week, I did a talk on the, uh, the real estate investment sector last week, uh, covering everything to do with property and um, uh, all of the stuff that... Um, you know what's going on in the market a lot of people are, are nervous about the market at the moment a lot of people are concerned about what could happen so what i'll do is i will kick off my uh my slides and just um i've got slides over on youtube live if you want to um if you want to tune in over there otherwise i'll be dealing with questions directly in tiktok here but um i'm actually using a slideshow over on youtube so opening up my slides and let's just present there. Right, so well, let's get into the show. And um, I'm going to do a little bit of a welcome, obviously. Uh, we have got um, lots of different people that are um, tuning in from different places to go and see uh, this talk and um, I'll be inviting some people in this. If you want to interact directly on screen with me, then I'm over in um, Zoom and uh, you got to pre-register for that. But uh, for those of you on YouTube and TikTok, here we go. Um, so today I'm gonna to be doing um, a talk on news, outlook, all of the stuff that's happening in the property market at the moment. There's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, it's it's kind of a uh, it's a nervous time. There's a lot of people that are predicting that there's going to be a big fall in the market, and so I shall um, uh, I'll try and do the best I can to kind of cover all of that stuff. Um, but in the interim, let's get into um, my slides. So, a bit of an introduction to me. I've been involved in property uh, development now, investment development, all sorts of aspects of property for over, uh, next year will be 30 years since I bought my first property. I bought my first property at the age of 20 and, um, and I went on to buy lots of things in lots of different countries. There's a slide here that I like to share and it covers some of the stuff that I'm uh, involved in. And I was based in uh, Spain, I was based in Africa, I was based in Dubai. I was based in Doha, um, a lot of different places um, around the world. I bought property in America, in New York City, and um, and then across Ireland, I did a huge number of projects, um, retail and residential and things like that. So I've been around the block. I think I've seen a fair bit. I, I kind of I've been predicting a bit of a downturn for a while. I have a podcast, as you probably know. And the podcast, I've been talking about it for, I'd say, nine months now about this kind of de uh, downturn. So that's the how the podcast looks if you're watching in on the YouTube screen. And um, I'm now running East Point Business Park. East Point is a large business park based in Dublin. We um, we built it from scratch. We actually bought the land off, the, off Dublin Corporation way back in the 1990s. And when we bought this land from Dublin Corporation, it was a landfill site. It was a it was the municipal dump in in the Dublin area for many many years, and uh, we bought it and mediated the site, put in all sorts of piping and stuff to take the the gases out of it, 
and then compounded it so that it could be built on. And fast forward 25 years, and the place looks pretty good. Um, we have a um, we have 37 buildings occupied by about 50 different companies, ranging from um, Google and Oracle, Enterprise Ireland, all the way to you know just lots of multinationals and things like that. So let's get into the news and the outlook. That's enough on me. Uh, just to, the, the headlines that I'm looking at here, if you want to watch them over on the YouTube channel, you'll see them live. But um, the first one that pops out and that I saw earlier on in the week last Friday, it was the Guardian newspaper uh, for the UK. And um, it was, the headline is, kicking myself, I didn't move faster. And it has, the subheading is that like, fear and panic grips the housing market. Uh, now, there is fear and panic starting to grip the housing market in the UK because of the uh, issues there with the budget. And when, he, when, the, when the new government, when the new prime minister and the, the finance person, when they started this whole process um, of starting a, new, um, starting a new budget and everything like that, what that actually did was drive an awful lot of people um, drive an awful lot of people to worry about interest rates, the way they're heading. The guys went and put in way, you know, just a fairly, uh, what would you say, a careless, um, a careless budget was put forward. And with a careless budget put forward, it, it, it kind of basically made the, the market um, dive in value. And, uh, and I see some comments here. Big fan of the podcast. Great to have you on. Thanks very much. Um, I will be going into questions. Let me just, I should have started with some of the housekeeping, okay? Mm -hmm. Before I get into the news, the way it's going to be is I have guests that have signed up for the Zoom call, and the Zoom call, those guys will actually get to ask the first questions. After that, then I'll be dealing with the chat. There's going to be the YouTube chat and there's the TikTok chat. So if you, if you guys have got questions or anything like that, drop them in the chat. I'll deal with them, but it'll be after I've covered the news and stuff like that. So sit back and uh, just listen to what I have to say between now and then. Shouldn't be any more than about 45 minutes. So look, um, the Guardian newspaper is talking about this fear and panic gripping the market. Now that, you know, what you've got to remember is newspapers, if it bleeds, it leads. These guys will always write uh, articles that have a, a, an attention grabbing headline. That is the the business that they're in, grabbing your attention. So you have to always take a certain pinch of salt with news headlines. Um, if you see something that's really kind of like CNN is one of the worst for this. They have these really like shocking headlines that makes you kind of want to, oh my God, am I in trouble or I'm in, I'm in danger or whatever. And you go in and then you realize it's just another article pretty much saying the exact same thing, but the headline grabs your attention. Um, now, having said all that, I have been watching this and I've been predicting this myself and I've been quite nervous about the way the market is going. And primarily because when the pandemic happened, you had a huge influx of cash injection by the governments. And a lot of people, a lot of economists were saying this injection of cash is going to push inflation up. And that's exactly what it's doing and what it has done. And we're in a difficult situation now. Um, we have somebody entering the Zoom room. We have a really difficult situation now because inflation is something that cannot be ignored. It has got to be um, immediately dealt with by the central banks and stuff because it, it has the ability to get in to the currency and devalue everything. And if you do that, then the cost of things like fuel and all that will just get even more expensive because it's all priced in dollars. And if you're paying in euro or if you're paying in pounds, then uh, the, those differentials will actually drive up prices on you and it'll actually make inflation worse. So everybody is reacting to this. Interest rates have shot up in, um, in, in America, first of all. They're quickest to react usually. And then in addition to that, we have got the, um, the, um, uh, the UK. They, after they announced their budget and after the market reacted badly to it, it suddenly pushed up um, the rates um, bond rates and everything like that. It's complicated, but basically people started selling British gilts. And when they did that, that pushed up the price of borrowing for the government. And it pushed it up higher than the price of borrowing for people. So everyone could see the writing was on the wall. They're basically saying, well, we're in trouble now because what's going to happen is 
the rates are going to catch up to the level that they're now that the government is paying. So people are expecting like fixed rate mortgages have now risen to 6% for the first time since 2008. And just like a, a year ago, you were you were at kind of like nearly half that, you know. So imagine if you're paying a mortgage and your mortgage rate has doubled. That is going to have a dramatic impact on your ability to keep your home, pay for things. It's going to push everything into a recession, in my opinion, because most people, the last thing they can do is sell the house. Um, if you sell the house, obviously, you're going to possibly be selling it into a falling market so you could lose money. So a lot of people are going to get frozen and locked into the situation that they're in. But they can do nothing about it because inflation is running at a 40-year high. And uh, back when, 40 years ago, interest rates were running at 16%. So 6% is actually quite low compared to where it could be going. Uh, I've got a graph on the screen here if you're looking in YouTube, and this graph shows you mortgage rates. Um, repayments are set to swallow up a much, much bigger percentage of people's income. So it was way back in the 1990s. I mentioned 40 years ago. Back in the 1990s, interest rates were uh, costing people about 30% of their paycheck. And then it dropped right back down. And for the last number of years, it's been somewhere between 20 and 15%. So it's been pretty low. All of a sudden, we're now looking at rates jumping up. They're now back up at 27%. And the problem is, is that we're not stopped yet. This could actually continue to go on and it could go higher and higher. So we're a little bit nervous about what could happen with rates. If they continue to go up, you're looking at you know real difficulty in the market. And that is why headlines like panic and fear is gripping the market are out there. This is from, these are the headlines from the last couple of days in the property sector from the Financial Times. And as you can see, like Barrett Developments, Barrett is a huge house building company in the UK. And they are their own press release coming out saying that demand for new build homes is cooling fast, okay? Now to say that is quite um, something when you're a house builder, because obviously if you start saying that kind of thing, you're gonna be making purchasers a little bit nervous potentially. And so all of a sudden, for the actual house builder to come out and say that house prices are cooling fast, they have to do this because they're a public company. And when you're a public company, you have to give profit estimates for the next quarter and all that. And so they have no choice but to tell the market that prop profits are likely to fall. And that is because house you know, costs are cooling fast. So the industry is warning about the sector's failure to cut emissions. That is something that is also important, but it won't be the headline grabbing stuff. I mean, we all know that climate change is a major problem. The sector is trying to reduce it. I know certainly in the commercial sector that I'm involved in, commercial properties are going through this huge rebuild at the moment where they're looking at making them much greener, much more environmentally friendly. And it costs a lot of money to do that. Um, I can tell you because we've just got some uh, quotations in from builders to, to improve properties. And it is not easy. I can tell you, um, we've we've actually got prices coming in that the construction cost is coming in at nearly 60% or 40% more than the building's value. Okay. So it's it's just it's kind of reached this crazy level. Um the US property sector is braced for job cuts as rate rises crush home sales. So real estate business uh, has dried up in the pandemic. What that is, is America, like what happened in the UK, and I have some graphs to show you guys here today. What happened in the UK, um, when the pandemic happened, prices shot up. Everyone started buying like crazy. Why? Because interest rates dropped to nearly zero. Same thing happened in Ireland here with the euro in the eurozone. But the difference is, is that because we were so badly burnt back in 2008, the central bank here has really, really restrictive policies around borrowing. So if you get into, you go into a bank to borrow now, they're going to go through your credit history. First of all, they're going to have a look at all sorts of, you know, stuff that took place maybe 10 years ago, whatever. But in addition to that, they are now looking at what are you earning? The maximum you can borrow is three and a half percent of what you, uh, three and a half times you're earning. Okay. Now that is really bad. Um, I mean, that's very, very low. House prices continue to rise and it's pushing people out. So it's no longer really available to a lot of them. So 
Um, there's another thing there that China property crisis spoil, uh, spoils communist party moment of triumph. Now, that is something that I've been talking about for a while. This all started last, I think it was probably last September, October, when I did a podcast and I talked about Evergrande. Now, those of you who are aware, Evergrande is this huge Chinese property company that has 300 billion of debt. And with 300 billion of debt, um, it's it's just, it's crumbling under the weight of that debt. And what's happened is it caused the uh, the market to basically start to look a little bit nervous. And then the Chinese brought in these rules. They're called the three lines, I think, the three red lines. And all developers in, the Ch in China could not go above or below these red lines. And what they've done is they've thrown a complete spanner in the Chinese market, made it extremely difficult for the people who are developing all these huge housing schemes to actually sell them because they, they can't borrow enough money um, and they have to keep a certain amount of cash on the books. All of this stuff was creating all these rules. Now, fast forward uh, a year and the Chinese gov uh, government now is actually trying to turn back things and actually make it easier for the Chinese. So the Chinese market is also having an effect on the global market in terms of real estate. So you've got the US market in difficulty, China market in difficulty, now, Turkey is also in difficulty. I mentioned this last week. Turkey's uh, inflation is running at 80% at the moment, which is astronomical. And so the value of everything in Turkey is falling. And um, it's making it extremely expensive for the people living in Turkey. So there's multiple jurisdictions around the world that are in the process of going through an economic, either a crash or a recession or a crisis or whatever. And uh, and this is starting to kind of show up in the sentiment of the market around mortgages, the, the fact that mortgages are now rising in price. Um, all of this is just having a huge impact. And the confidence that people had is immediately just dissipating. And you're not going to have anybody um, running out there to buy property in this market. It is going to become a buyer's market, uh, where it's, as for the last two, three years, it has been a seller's market in a big way. Now, some headlines from my own um, newspapers here in Dublin. The construction cost surge, again, um, costs are to surge because of concrete levy. Now, this is uh, an unusual thing is we already have massive construction cost increases in the property market at the moment. And they're about to get even worse because of this uh, concrete levy that the government is going to introduce. And anyone who's unaware of this, but... There was this big issue with concrete um, back in the last recession. And what we had is houses were built with uh, a type of product that was not, not well um, tested. And so it's created, uh, the, the, the concrete is basically starting to fail. So there's hundreds of people, I don't know exactly the numbers, but there's lots and lots of people that are affected by these houses that are sort of crumbling around them. And in order to kind of try to fund those people um, and fund the kind of replacement of their, their homes and stuff like that, this levy is being, is being put on the construction. And so that's going to push up prices even higher. And that's already a problem. Now, as you can see in this other headline that we have, <coughs> investors um, have pulled out of uh, build to rent uh, developments. Now, this to some people, this is going to be kind of a good thing. A lot of people are calling these German funds and these very big funds that are coming into the Irish market. They're kind of, um, they're arriving in and they're buying up entire schemes. And an awful lot of people are saying, you know, they're calling them cuckoo funds. Okay. They're coming in and they buy up the entire scheme and then they rent them out and they're getting these kind of strong prices. And uh, the problem is now that because of construction prices going up, and because of interest rates going up as well. And then on top of that, because interest rates uh, for borrowing are going up, what's actually happening is German bonds and investments that these big funds like to make that are much, much easier to get in and out of, those have become much, much more attractive. And so all of a sudden, the big funds are now starting to depart the market. And so that actually could mean that a lot of projects are put on hold. Um, so this, this particular one, Dublin has suffered a heavy blow as 400 million uh, euros worth of deals um, on two landmark apartment projects have unraveled. And so the German property fund Commerce Real has basically 
uh, exited a deal, a 200 million deal, um, to buy a, a into a 30 story apartment building in um, in, in Liffey Valley, and uh, this is a difficult one. And then there's another project that uh, Chartered Land was doing, and they've also lost the the funding as well. So there is some real difficulty in the market, and we're hearing more of this um, now. There's there's a lot of headlines about you know there's a soft landing for the Irish property market. Unlikely. Uh, a lot of people are starting to kind of think now. This was something that I've been debating over the last while because you have a couple of different things. You've got the market rising on the one hand uh, because of demand, like everybody needs a property, and supply is really really bad. So everybody, uh, all the builders are trying to catch up. So when there's supply and demand imbalances like that, it makes it kind of a bit of a no-brainer that prices will go up. But now that interest rates have started to creep up and now that construction prices are starting to creep up, you're starting to see people pull out of the market. So um, because of that, there actually could be a bit of a fall in the market. Now, it may be cushioned by the demand, but it's hard to say. It's very, very hard to say because if people are um, on the verge of um, being able to pay for something and they're being pushed out of the market by the prices and stuff. I mean, they might have a property, they might have a real need to buy a property, but if they are unable to afford the payments, if the central bank rules will not allow them to get that mortgage, and if the banks themselves are starting to apply greater um, tests and stuff like that, um, as to whether you can afford this, I've heard a couple of deals now falling through because the banks have started to stress test your ability to pay. And when they start stress testing it, all of a sudden you're into a situation where you're, you know, you thought you had the money, you thought you were able to go ahead with this purchase, and suddenly the banks say, "Sorry, we don't think you can afford it. You need to reduce your your aspirations. You need to buy a, a cheaper house, or you need to go for a lower mortgage and put in a bigger deposit, whatever it is." So this is having a big impact, and it's causing a lot of people. They're saying here, turmoil in the UK's financial market has prompted analysts to predict that house prices in the UK could fall by as much as 20%. Now, I actually saw in the um, in the Sunday Business Post recently, there was an economist predicting a 40% fall in UK house prices. So, uh, and, and this, you know, it would not surprise me, um, given the situation over there, because they've pulled out of, uh, with Brexit and all that kind of stuff, there's all these additional issues and concerns and, and challenges that they are facing. Um, some of the reason that housing supply has been held back is due to outdated restrictions. And that is something that we've actually found. We have looked at building apartments ourselves, and there's, there's an awful lot of rules on how to design, how to build. And when you're trying to design something, you're trying to get the maximum out of your site in order to deliver the most units. Naturally, we want to make a profit, but also because the cost of home uh, of building apartments is so high now that a lot of schemes are marginal unless you're selling the entire scheme to a big fund. And those funds are now pulling out of the market. So it's going to mean that the schemes that are being, that were going to be sold to those funds are not profitable if they're selling the units to individual owners. So it's going to, it's going to be a really difficult moment. Um, the energy crisis is adding 60,000 to the price of well-insulated homes. Now, this is something that I, I actually mentioned in a, in a podcast a couple of months back, I was talking about the, you know, the stuff that I'm seeing on the commercial side with everyone, you know, doing these big sustainability. And um, there's an awful lot of people start starting to insulate better. They're putting in all these green kind of initiatives. They're, they're improving the building, um, the sustainability and the climate action and the, and the emissions and all that. All of that is really a huge focus in the commercial sector. But we haven't seen it so much in the residential sector. Well, we've seen it in the residential sector with new build and the stuff that I'm building in Shank Hill at the moment. That is very much a, um, a those are really, really well insulated. Like they're going to be A rated homes and A rated homes are going to be these ones that get the extra value. And you can basically move into an A rated home. You don't need to turn on your central heating almost ever because it's just so warm. Now, you go and buy a secondhand home that was built back in the 70s or something like that. You cannot, even in the summer, sometimes you have to turn on the heat. So those people are going to be feeling it really heavily now with the cost of gas and the cost of all these kind of energy costs shooting up. 
And so people are naturally saying, we've got to go and buy a uh, one of these A-rated homes. And that is obviously pushing the demand up for those homes. And now this is something that people who can afford it will do it. A lot of other people are not going to do it. And um, anyway, we'll see how we get on. Uh, funnily enough, I saw this headline. I was thinking, this is interesting. So NAMA, NAMA were this bank that was, that were this organization that was set up in Ireland to basically reduce uh, or to, to take over all the bad banks and all the bad loans and the assets and stuff that were created um, during the crash of 2008. And what's happened is they've turned into like basically the biggest developer in the country. And they're now offering expertise and know-how to the government to resolve the housing crisis. So it's kind of ironic that the guys that were kind of, that came in to, to basically solve all the banking problems are now actually the biggest developer in the country. Um, something that drove up house prices over the last while were basically the per, per, pervasive fear um, of not being able to get on the housing ladder. And that was a fear that pushed people into making these decisions and buying stuff. And that is, that's kind of difficult. And then uh, the Irish Times came out during the week with this headline, could interest rates hikes cause a property price crash in Ireland? And that is something that, you know, we're all starting to wonder. Now, we went through such a crash back in 2008. I got badly burnt in that. If you're listening to my podcast, I've discussed that uh, in the past, but you have to wonder. I'm going to go now into a little bit on the market impact. Okay, we've been talking about the headlines, but now there's a question here. And I've this is a bit of advice that I've seen before. Or like markets tend to move uh, as if they're taking the stairs. Okay, they get they markets rise upwards very very slowly, like you're taking the stairs, but they usually fall in the way that they're taking the elevator. So you have a very slow increase in the price. And then you have a very rapid fall in the price when, when the market turns. The question is, is that I'm asking is, are rather than taking the elevator, are prices about to take the window? <laughs> are uh, our property, is the market about to take the window instead of the elevator? And uh, that's a big question. I have a chart here on the UK house prices since 2009. And you can see that they have almost doubled in value in that period of time. So in little over 10 years, they've almost doubled in value. That is, you know, you have to question, is that sustainable? Because salaries have not increased by double in that period of time. Now, I have here a really interesting graph that goes back to 1994. And it's house prices are rising sharply across the OECD. Okay, the OECD is basically all the developed sort of economies of the world. And you can see the way the prices dropped in 2008. It dropped massively. Annual house prices went negative and they stayed negative for, you know, basically a year or two before they started to rise again. Now, if you have a look at this chart, you can see that during the pandemic, they shot up to the highest levels ever seen. And you have to wonder now with that big peak that they've shot up to, what kind of fall could you be looking at? And you could be looking at something that goes from, way up where we are now into major negative territory. And so that is, it's a huge concern for a lot of people because um, this could drop, uh, you know, you could be looking at a kind of 50% drop. I mentioned already, but I'm going to go just mention it again. There is a huge squeeze on in the market at the moment. Okay. You've got construction costs rising and because they're, they're rising because of su supply chain issues. We all know that the pandemic created all sorts of supply chain issues. Ships, cost of shipping and all that has shot through the roof. Um, in addition to that, China is still going through this thing where they're trying to have COVID zero policy. And so factories are shutting down, all this stuff is going on. It's, it's quite amazing what's happening in China at the moment. And in addition to that, here in Ireland uh, and in the UK and, and basically everywhere, there are labor shortages, okay? Because of the demand, because of the delay of the pandemic, everything got put on hold. All of a sudden, the project started opening up again and everyone wanted to get the projects built all as fast as possible. And so what that's done is it's pushed up the price of labor. And so new projects, if you want to start a new project, you're competing with people who are trying to catch up with the project that they already started pre-pandemic. Now, in addition to that, you have the extra squeeze now of borrowing costs, which are also starting to rise rapidly. And this is creating a double whammy 
because what you've got with with the creating of the uh, with the rising interest rates it means that your project funding is, has shot up okay so the cost when you're doing a development of a of a, a housing scheme or anything like that what happens is you go and you borrow most of the money so you go off to the bank and you sort of say here's our project we're going to borrow you know 2 million 5 million whatever it might be depending on the size of the scheme right in this particular case we are looking at um those costs rising. And with those costs rising, you're now looking at a situation where just the cost of the construction increases, the cost of the project increases through funding increases. But then on top of that, because borrowing is increasing, you've got fewer house buyers out there who are able to afford the property that you were selling before. So those interest rates that have increased, it's not just your interest rate on your mortgage. You've also got massive increases in your energy costs. So if you're trying to heat your home, that's going up as well. If you're trying to pay for the, the petrol or the diesel in your car, that's going up as well. So you're facing all of these costs. That's the house buyer. The developer is facing the increased funding cost and the increased construction cost. Now, in addition to that, the worst thing about it is that um, the large funds that were previously funding the huge developments of apartment schemes those are now reevaluating their investments and they're starting to pull out because whereas in the past they were able to buy um, you know, German bonds at like 0.03% or something like that. So it looked like a very poor investment in their eyes. And they looked at the Irish market and they said, well, we can get like three and 4% in the Irish market for a scheme with 150 apartments. Looked like a good deal. Suddenly German bonds are starting to creep up and all of a sudden they're saying, well, I think we'd prefer to hold on to German bonds than a load of apartments in Ireland. And so they started to dump and they started to pull out of projects. So the entire viability of the market, uh, of certainly those large apartment schemes, that is very much in question now. And an, an awful lot of the big schemes that were going to be are going to have to be shelved because the buyers of them are just going to pull out of the market. So that is going to be interesting to see. Now, is this a time for drama and crisis and desperation and all that? I have what I talk about, I call the, uh, the five deadly Ds during a crisis. And it's the stuff that you've got to think about. So a lot of you guys out there might be, you might have property and you might be thinking to yourself, well, we have got a difficult situation. Um, what are we going to do about it? The, the, the big mistakes that people make when there, if there is this kind of a drama is initially they will, they will, be, they will deny they will um, they will be in denial. They will just basically say to themselves, well, um, you know, I think this is a problem for everyone else. I don't think it's really a problem for me. Now, a lot of the reason that they'll be in denial is because there's painful realities if you if you deny if you accept this, okay? So the reason you enter into denial is because you're thinking to yourself, okay, so um, the car payments that I'm making, that's going to be squeezed. This is going to be squeezed. That is going to be squeezed my ability to go and enjoy myself, go on holidays, that's about to be squeezed. All of that stuff makes you go into a situation where your mind is telling you, this is not going to affect me. This is everyone else overreacting. And so people tend to deny that they are in a difficult situation. That denial, that's the, so drama is the first D, denial is the second D. The third D is delay. Because you're denial, you're delaying. You're delaying a very, very important, valuable decision that has to be made. And what that means is that that delay that you are, it's going to cost you a lot of money. A lot of your um, ability to shore up the difficulty that you're in is not going to be taken because of the delay. And so that is a big, big problem. Deliberation, right? Eventually, after delaying, denial and de delay, you'll eventually start to see everyone else panicking and running around and stuff. And that's when you start to go, whoa. And that's the deliberation process. That is where you start to realize, well, I may be in trouble here. Maybe I should do something about this. And you're in this deliberation stage where you're, oh, should I, should I not? Should I, should I not? And you're sitting on the fence before you make a decision. Decision is what has to be taken. Bang, take the decision. Now, the five Ds, drama, denial, delay, deliberation, and decision. If you want to act in a, in a crisis, try to eliminate that denial and that delay and that deliberation stage. Just make the decision, move quickly. We are entering into what looks to me to be a pretty serious uh, recession. You need to be cutting back on your overhead and your costs and stuff. If you guys have got, you know, um, 
various things that you pay every month, try to kind of offload those things because you're going to suddenly find there's a squeeze on everything. And the real opportunity out there is going to be when the price is up, when the market you know, is in difficulty, that's when people start selling things and they start selling things like a fire sale and it pushes down prices. And when you're into that situation, you can actually pick up great bargains. And some of the people that have made the most money in the last 10 years are the ones that acted at the bottom of the market. And they bought stuff at you know one third of the value that it is today. So even if they're suffering a fall now, they're still well in the money. Um, now, preparation is key. Planning in ahead, planning ahead, and practicing those plans. Just it's a, it's all it's a little bit late now if you haven't been sort of preparing for this. But one of the reasons why people do fire drills is because when a fire takes place, panic takes over, and everybody's wondering what are we going to do. And so you practice fire drills for that reason because you just have to follow the path of what you've done in the past, and that's 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 one of the ways to deal with it. Um, I'm going to just quickly talk about. Uh, cognitive bias. Okay, one of the things that creates a real problem in the market is your, uh, your cognitive bias, and that is cognitive bias is a limitation in objective thinking that is caused by a tendency for the human brain to perceive information through a filter of personal experience and preferences. Right? That's a long way of saying this is your short. This is a shortcut that your brain automatically takes. Okay. And we all have cognitive bias, but we a lot of the time we do not realize that we have it. And um, one of the big problems is you're not aware of it, then you're going to be in real difficulty because your brain is telling you this is what we should do, when in fact you should do the opposite. And um, one of the ex examples of that is, and we've been talking about all the headlines in the newspapers and stuff, availability cascade bias. Now that is a, a bias that people have, and it's basically herd behavior. And that's when herd behavior takes over and you don't push back. You hear everybody is buying property in a rising market and you think, OK, I'm going to buy that. You don't think to yourself, is this a good idea? It's called groupthink. Everybody is basically doing it. And so you follow suit. That is available availability cascade bias. And that is when everybody sees positive headlines and all that kind of stuff. And they decide, yeah, this makes sense. Let's go and do the same. Um, that is when contrarians win. So you'll have people that are out there like um, the, the guys that made all the money back in 2008. They went completely against the market. Everyone was calling them mad. Everyone was kind of shouting at them. Why aren't you buying instead of you know shorting the market? And in the end, they made billions. And so just be aware that all of the headlines around you, everybody saying the same thing often is a cascade bias. Framing or authority bias. Okay, here I, I actually there's a way that I actually show um, I illustrate this on the if you're if you're looking at the YouTube channel I have a photograph of two people I have a homeless person and I have Elon Musk and the question is which one would you ask um, if you were looking for investment advice Okay, and it's a pretty obvious answer if you're looking for investment advice you're probably going to ask Elon Musk the reality is is that that is a framing or an authority bias, okay? You automatically think the guy that looks successful is the one that will give me the best advice. And, uh, and, and it's kind of an obvious thing as to why, but that can be used against you. You can have, that is how scammers work. They, they, they create this credibility that enhances their perceived value. So you'll find that you're out there, you're talking about a big game. Oh, look at all the money I've made. Look at the fast car that I'm driving or the jet that I'm flying in and stuff. And people fall hook, line, and sinker for the story. And it could be that this person is selling you a lemon. This could be that person has completely, is motivated by something completely different to you. And it's just trying to offload like something at a, at a discount for you. So don't be lazy, do your research. Don't automatically fall hook, line, and sinker for authority or for somebody who you perceive to know a lot. Now, I, I've actually seen, for example, me, with the podcast that I have, a lot of people ask me advice and stuff. And I give what I consider to be solid, sound advice, but don't take just straight away what I say and kind of say, you know, this is great advice. I'll go and do that. Do your homework, do your research, make sure that you're not following exactly what I say because you perceive me to have all the answers. The next one is confirmation bias. Okay. Confirmation bias usually happens when you're in the process of researching a deal. Now, one of the big problems is that. Um, instead of researching whether you should buy the deal, what people do 
is they make the decision that they are buying the deal. They just, they want to go ahead, they want to buy, and that's it. And because of that decision, they um, they now look for evidence that will support that decision. So instead of having a situation where you're looking at the market and you're saying, oh, I shouldn't buy, you've decided that actually I really want to buy that house. And so you'll go out looking for brochures or magazines or something like that, that actually says, yeah, this area is really good. And that is um, one of the right reasons that selling agents, their motivation. Um, talking about house prices, continuing by our continuity bias. Now that's something we've all suffered from in the last while. The market has been rising. We all thought that it's going to continue to rise. Suddenly this, these events like Russia, the invasion, the interest rate, the inflation, the pandemic, all of these things all happened very, very quickly after one another. And now we're in a situation where the market could well fall. Now, that is continuity bias working against you. It also works on the way down, though. When you're in a very, very difficult, bad market, continuity bias will tell you that it's always going to be like this. It's never going to get any better. Uh, and, and you just sort of end up in that kind of really negative frame of mind. That also is continuity bias. And you've got to know that the market will reach its bottom and that's when you should get in. And when you get in, the market will rise again. And so it's just, it might take time, but continuity by something to be very aware of. Present moment bias, that's the tendency to opt for a quick payday. So somebody comes along and says, oh, that's a nice property you've built. I'll give you a 20 grand profit or 50 grand profit or whatever. And you go, yeah, absolutely, I'll take that. And you think it's great that you've sold the property for a little profit. But the reality is, is perhaps if you're held on long term, you'd make that back over many, many years. And you'd actually continue to hold the property, making money. The first property that I bought, which next year, it'll be 30 years since I bought it. I, I moved into it for a while and then I rented it to a guy. And that guy paid me over a period of 18 years. He paid me five times what I bought the property for. Um, he just kept on paying rent for 18 years. He paid me I, I, the entire cost of the house after a couple of years and again, and again, and again, and again. Now, if I if somebody had come along and said, uh, I bought it for, I think, 85000 or whatever, if I had bought that property um, and somebody had come along and said, I'll give you 100 uh, or 110 or something like that, 25 grand profit, I might have said, oh, wow, yeah, let me, let me take that property. Let me take that profit. And I would have missed out on basically being paid four times again the entire cost of that property. So be aware of present moment bias. And that is connected to the restraint bias. A lot of people have a tendency to overestimate their ability to resist temptation. And so there's a funny study, and it is the one with kids and marshmallows. And it's actually dates back 40 years. And what they did is they put a load of kids into a room with a marshmallow on the table. And they basically sat the kid there and they said, we're we'll back in five minutes. And if you don't eat the marshmallow, you'll be able to have two marshmallows when I come back. And the kids are sitting there and after five minutes, straight into the mouth, they couldn't resist. Now, the, 40 years later, they've gone to have a look at these very same people that were in that test. And they found that the kids that were able to resist temptation 40 years ago are today very, very successful people. The others that chomped down on the marshmallow, not as successful. And they put it down to the, just the ability to resist temptation. And then finally, I'm going to finish up on disposition bias. And this is something that will apply to a lot of people that are currently, if they are experiencing difficulty in the market, or this could be around um, crypto losses, or it could be around stock market losses, it could be around anything. But there's a tendency to sell the profitable and hold the losers whenever you are thinking about selling an asset. Okay. So let's say, for example, you have a house that you bought for 100 and is now worth 200. And then you have another house that you were bought for 100 and is now worth 50, okay? So you have two properties. You paid 100 for both. One's now worth 100, one's worth 50. Which one should you sell to free up capital? Um, a lot of people will say, that's a no-brainer. Sell the one that you're up 100. And so you sell that property, you're up 100, and happy days. But the reality is that house that's, that went up by 100, that could have gone up to 300, 400, 500 over the next couple of years. Whereas the one that has lost the money and gone to 50, maybe 50, it would have actually stay at 50 and it could still be at 50 a year later and stuff. 
So you've not made anything. So the thing is, is don't automatically go to the profitable one to sell. Look at the underlying asset and say, okay, why did the why did that rise by a hundred? Is it is there a chance that it'll rise to two hundred and to three hundred? And the one that fell to fifty, is there a reason that it fell to fifty? Uh, a lot of people don't like to take a loss, but if you if you're going to be in the investment market, you have got to bite the bullet. Sometimes you've just got to accept that you don't win them all, and if by holding on to a loss maker you think somehow you're not going to take a loss and you're, you know, this is some way of you basically never making a loss. You'll end up selling that property years later for this for 50. So you'd be better off getting out and putting the 50 into something that will actually double or treble. I know I bought a property years ago and I paid 500,000 for it. And I was convinced it was going to jump in value to about a million. And I hung on to it and I hung on to it and I hung on to it. And in the end, we, we sold it in auction for 130. So we lost over 370,000 on that deal. And that was just in, not being willing to say that we had we'd made a loss, you know. So those of you who are, are interested, I have a, uh, a mastermind accelerator and I, I basically, the, the there's a new intake open. Anyone who's interested in being coached by me, I'm doing a presentation tomorrow at 4 p.m. online. You can find it by going into my Calendly calendly.com forward slash Gavin J Gallagher. If you go into that, you can go and book to, to sit in on that presentation and I'll talk about the program and stuff. Um, it's There's a little slide on what the program covers, roadmap, financial analysis, portfolio building, and how to pitch to investors. So now I'm going to throw it open to questions. And the one I'm going to start with is the one in Zoom. So we have a question. Um, it's starting to get a late here. Okay. So that was just as somebody making a nice comment. So we have a question here. I, I'm a big fan of your podcast. I'm in sixth year in school. So now is not a good time for me to watch. I was thinking about doing an auctioneering course next year. If I messaged you on Facebook, would you be able to give me your opinion? Of course, he has to go now. Yeah, that's no problem. If you're watching this on the replay, I'll be happy to do that. Now let's have a look at the all the TikTok. We have some TikTok questions, which I'll be happy to answer. And um, so I've got to go down and scroll through the all of the messages. So let's have a look. So what do we have? Um, this concrete with mica is still being produced. No regulation. Yeah, I mean, the mica problem is a major problem at the moment. And a lot of people are, hold on, let me stop the slides. There we go. Um, the mica problem here in Ireland. Um, so mica, for those of you who are listening in from abroad, mica is this... Um, substance that basically they found in the sand or the concrete that was used in concrete in the cement and because of that what's actually happened is um the stuff has started to collapse um crumble you can see buildings on the west particularly on the west coast of this country there's buildings that are just starting to crumble and they're basically having to be rebuilt so that is a massive issue um 166,000 vacant homes you're the problem, mate. Oh, okay. Well, we always get the haters and the trolls. Um, free money from central banks. Yeah, that was the big problem. Um, when the central banks started handing out all this free money, what they did, what they created this inflation problem. And the, um, sorry about the shaking. Hold on a sec. Let me just still this. Um, the big problem with the central banks when they were giving out all the money is they did not believe that this was going to be a problem. Their focus at the time was on creating, uh, making sure that the economy didn't collapse. So what they did was rather than bite the bullet at the time and let the economy fall down, they went and um, they, they basically poured money into the market. So they delayed the fall and now they're dealing with the repercussions of that. And I actually think that it is, um, we have a major problem on our hands. Like this, this is the highest inflation we've had in 40 years. And 40 years, I do not think you rectify 40 years worth of information or of, of inflation just by increasing rates one or 2%. I think it's actually going to have to go up quite a bit. Um, let me go down. Will uh, the Irish ever form a building contractor or take charge of a large construction? You mean the Irish government uh, to create a big building contract? I personally don't think so. I mean, you could have the OPW. That's the Office of Public Works here. And the Office of Public Works is a... Um, it's, it's like the government 
and they come in and they go they do construction and stuff like that but once you get into that the the problem is un, you get they get unionized and all this kind of stuff so i i just wonder is that going to be something that is possible um like there's some huge construction firms in the country the problem isn't so much the government getting involved the problem is the just the construction sector the inflation is so high at the moment and then these borrowing costs on top of that they're just they're squeezing every every project from both sides you know what do you think of the city edge um i think the city edge that's basically people uh, i'm not so sure what what exactly the question is i need more more detail what do you think about the property market for 2022 will demand continue no i don't i don't think so i think that we are in a situation where um demand is going to continue to be there but affordability is going to make it impossible um to actually get in and the central bank rates unless the central bank reduce their restrictions and so at the moment three and a half times your earnings is the max you can borrow if they are prepared to change that and increase it to five times or something like that maybe then but at the moment you've got people that are struggling to pay rent struggling to pay their mortgage as it is and then on top of that we've got fuel you've got energy costs you've got all of this kind of, even food costs like you look go to the shops these days the cost of um filling your basket is like a lot more so all of those costs are squeezing people as well and then um, i know the banks are starting to look at the ability to afford mortgages and stuff uh, mica affected homes being sold to people through auction sites well what that is, is when you're buying a property like that, you are not necessarily buying it without being aware of it. I think what's happened is because I actually am aware of a couple of people that I know that are buying mica uh, affected homes and they're buying them for an absolute song. Like they're getting a property that might be worth 200,000 if it didn't have mica and they're able to buy it for like 60 or 70 or something like that. And they're basically taking the view that I'll buy it for 60 or 70 and I'll refurbish and renovate and I'll fix the problem with the mica. I'll do that by getting the grants that are being offered and I'll put my own money in. And I think I'll actually end up making some good money on that. So that it's not necessarily people being unscrupulous and selling you a mica home without saying anything, but it is something to, um, to bear in mind. So housing for all isn't going to work. Uh, well, if you can deliver housing for all, fine, but who funds it? How does it get funded? This is one of the big problems. Everything is going to shit soon. Yeah, I, I, I would think that we are going to be looking at difficult times. I think you just need to be careful not to get into a situation where you, uh, you get, you know, you allow the negativity to affect your objectivity. Like when you're in a problem, when you're in a crisis, uh, there's opportunities everywhere. But if you think that you're in a crisis, then you're not going to take advantage of those, um, those kind of things. Yeah. How are the Irish banks balancing the books with thousands of worthless property on the books? They, well, obviously, they've had low interest rates, like 0% for the last couple of years. So they've been carrying those losses. Also, they offloaded a lot of that stuff to the big, to these big funds. And uh, the big funds went and bought it. And they're sitting on their books at like, you know, one, uh, at maybe 10 cents in the dollar or 10, 10 cents in the euro. Hi, I'm 29. I have 60,000 in the market, stocks and crypto, and 70,000 in cash. Is this a good start and any advice? Well, I think it's a I think it's great that you have cash. I would be wary of stocks and crypto. I do think there could be a, a fall in values on stocks. Crypto, I mean, look, crypto has had an amazing wild ride, but it also it's so volatile that if you if you're holding a lot of and it could fall in value, like it could go to zero, depending on what you're holding. Like I think certain ones like Bitcoin are probably pretty good, but you got to be very careful when you get into that. Stocks, I think we could be looking at like the big question isn't so much is it a good start or whatever. It is, do you have the mental uh, fortitude that you need to be an investor in a very, very volatile market? A lot of people. They cannot stand to see the big swings. It's great when it's all going up, but when it starts to go down and when you start to see that you're losing money and you've, you've lost more than you actually put into the market, that's when people tend to start hate the market. They're watching it every minute of the day and they're starting to panic about it. The thing is, is markets, investment, all that, it has to be long-term. You should be thinking 20 years out. 
And if you're thinking 20 years out, then you'll probably do perfectly fine. The market will bounce back in 20 years. You'll be worth four or five times what you paid. But if you're going to be watching it all the time and you're watching the fluctuations and stuff, then it's terrible. I, I put money into my pension, you know, 15 years ago, and I didn't look at it for 15 years. And then I had a look at it there recently. And one of the stocks that I bought 15 years ago had risen by 5x. OK, so the money I put in, it's gone up by five times that. Now, at the same time, some of the other ones that I put in went almost to zero. So, you know, there's, there's a balance between the two. Uh, but other, in, in, the to in terms of the total amount I put into that portfolio, one went up five times, one lost everything. And then, but the general drift of direction was good. And I ended up basically making about 2.8x what I put into the market. Let me just go down through some more questions. How about uh, one house each for everyone? <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice. We all live in the uh, in a communist society. Then that's what it would be like. Uh, we have some hey hellos. Hello, everybody. It's good to see you guys. Um, I'm just going down through comments here, and I see what do you call a deaf guy? <laughs> okay, we have some good um, some good jokes in the chat there. If anyone's looking at the TikTok. Um, so Jerry, Jerry's asking the only price to be aware of is what you buy and what you sell. Otherwise, it's just a number. Yeah, too, too many people get caught up in the value through the hold period. And really, it's the day you buy uh, and the day you sell. Those are the only times that matter and that you can hold on. People, if they start banking on, you know, the price I bought for 100, it's now 200. And you start to get into your head that I'm now worth 200. But if that property falls back to like 150, you're going to be in depression because you're going to be saying, I was worth 200 and now it's 150. That's one of the big problems that we have is that people, they don't have the mental fortitude to sort of hold out there. We have somebody saying, hi, Gavin, if you had 50,000 to invest, what you, would you invest? In? I wouldn't invest at the moment. I'd be holding cash um, because I do think that it's going to get tough. And I think having cash puts your mind in a really great place. And you're able to act then when you see opportunities and just be objective, just sit back and watch the market. I think we're in for a rough ride. So I think anyone who's investing today, I think you could um, you could just find that your, your, your 50 is worth 25 in a couple of months' time. So be wary. S&P 500 EFTs, fees, tax rules are insane, given the seven-year forced to say, yeah, I know, listen, I've been caught by some of that sort of seven-year stuff. All right, guys, look, I promised that uh, this whole talk would be about 45 minutes. We are just about coming up on the uh, that period. So I'm, uh, I'm about to close out. If anyone has a final question, shoot. Otherwise, I will see you same time next week. I'm doing it every week at one o'clock. And so um, I'm happy to do these things. And remember to go and check out my uh, podcast, Behind the Facade, and my YouTube channel. If you're watching on TikTok, I have my YouTube channel where this is this whole stream has been um, has been played out. And that is the uh, Gavin Gallagher, Gavin J. Gallagher on uh, real estate. How long do you think the market could last, the, the bear market? It could be a couple of years. Uh, like usually they're not that, they don't last that long, but in the Irish market, yes, recession. When the Irish market collapsed in 2008, it did not rebound until around 2014. So you're talking about six years. Now that was a really staggering crash. So I don't think we'd be looking at something like that. But then if you go back to 1999, 2000, when the, when the, when the dot-com bubble crashed, it took 14 years for the, uh, the dot-com stocks to actually go, get back to the level they had been at, 14 years. So there can be long periods waiting. But I do think that as long as affordability is a major issue, there's going to be difficulty um, sort of selling stuff um, because the people that want to buy it, the people, there's a demand, people that want to buy cannot buy because prices uh the, the the borrowing costs are too high and they're being they're under pressure from all of this kind of inflation across fuel um food goods all that kind of stuff so that's the story guys i hope you enjoyed it i hope you found this useful and i'm going to close it out and i hope to see you again same time next week